Our prelude this morning is going to be played uh, by Ruth Thornton and Fred Pogue, our organist. It's called The Unveiled Christ, and then What a Wonderful Savior and Our Great Savior. So unveil Christ for us. Please join me in our call to worship. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. This is the good news. Once we were no people. Now we are God's people. This is the good news. Now we are citizens of a new city in a new world. The hymn is number 339, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Would you stand and join with us in hymn number 339?
We do join in that everlasting song and crown you Lord of all. As we gather together today, we gather in the spirit of your love. Like the rain falling all around us, we are soaked by your grace and inundated by your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us into your presence. And as we worship you today, we pray that our hearts might be open to the movement of your Holy Spirit. Touch us to the depths of our lives, to the deepest parts of our very soul. Help us to worship you love one another, and to leave here today ready to love the world in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite all of the children worshiping with us to come forward and join me on the front steps. Hey, come sit down. All right, small group today. I have something to show you. How many of you have rules at your school you have rules? What's one of the rules? Can't wear straps. You can't wear spaghetti straps. All right. <laughs> That's probably a good rule. What about, and what's another one? Don't misbehave. Don't misbehave. That's right. Bryson, what's a, a rule that you have at school? Don't run in the hallways. Don't run in the hallways. Raleigh, can you think of a rule from school? Can't think of one right now? He's never broken one, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't know what they are. That's right. That's what it is. Well, I have, I have what, what we have at our house. We have rules at our house, too, and this is called Rules for the Orr Family. And we have a list of rules here, and we keep one on our refrigerator. And Bryson and Raleigh both have a sheet like this that they keep in their room. And it helps us remember how we're going to organize our house and how we're going to behave, and it keeps us out of trouble. And some of these are... Read one of them for me. When we open something, we close it. When we open something, we close it. That's right. (laughs) That's one that daddy gets wrong sometimes. (laughs) Um, What's number three? We tell the truth. We tell the truth. That's right. And at the end, the last one says, when we disobey or forget any of the rules for the Orr family, we accept discipline and instruction. And one of the reasons we have to have rules at home and at school and at church and other places is so that we can know to do the right things. And it keeps us out of trouble and helps us to help each other. And we do rules because we love you all. And there's nothing that you can do that's going to make us stop loving you. And that's the way Jesus taught. When Jesus was with his disciples, he loved them no matter what they did, no matter what they said. And the last, one of the last things he told his disciples, he says, I give you a new rule. Love each other the way I've loved you. And that's the most important rule. And on our rules for the Orr family, we have those at the top. The first one says what, Bryson? We obey our Lord Jesus Christ. We obey our Lord Jesus Christ. And then number two? We love, res- we love respect, and pray for one another. We love, respect, and pray for one another. And when we put those two together, we know that we're following the command that Jesus gave to love each other the way he loved us. Let's pray and talk to Jesus. Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you for loving us. Help us to love each other the way you loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of a heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. 
And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O God, our Creator, all that you have made, all that you have done in our lives, all that you have given to us, cause us to say, Alleluia. We come before you as your sons and daughters, thankful for the giftedness around, for the rain that falls and grants growth to plants that feeds the soil and the animals, that helps us have sustenance in our lives. O Lord, we cry out, Alleluia. For the blessings of love and friendship, of family, we cry out, Alleluia. For the work of our hands that you have given us to enjoy, for creativity, ingenuity, imagination. We give you thanks and we cry out, Alleluia, Alleluia. You are good. We pray today for those among us who are hurting, who struggle in the hospital with grief, with loneliness, those who are imprisoned. We pray, O Lord, for these our, our loved ones, and we ask that your hand would be creator in their lives. Create for them the peace that they need, the hope that they need, the joy that they need. We pray for our world, for our nation. We pray for peace. And whenever peace reigns, help us to say Alleluia and to work hard for a day when we would no longer have to pray for peace anymore. We pray for our church and for our community. We pray that you would help us be good neighbors, that you would help us reach out to one another in love, that you would help us extend ourselves to get beyond ourselves and our self-centered thinking, 
that we could be the people that you have called us to be, that we could be a people of faith, a community of faith called and chosen to be your light in the darkness wherever it may be all around. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
reading today is John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look at me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is this world coming to? That's a question frequently found on the lips of people these days. For some of us, it's a very personal question as we awaken to the aches and pains of getting older and need what sometimes seems to be like two or three hours just to roll out of bed in the morning. Once upon a time, we were up and at them at the crack of dawn, but now we're just full of cracks and creaking joints that make us wonder, what is this world coming to? For others, it's the experience of significant life changes, like marriage or divorce or having children or moving from Michigan to Tennessee or losing a job or facing a serious illness. What is the world coming to? For the city of West Texas, just outside of Waco, the explosion at a fertilizer plant left 12 firefighters dead and a large portion of the town destroyed. And tragedies like these cause people to ask, what is the world coming to? And then there was the bombing of the Boston Marathon. What is this world coming to? The world in which we live is in a constant state of flux, always changing and becoming things that wasn't yesterday. Someone longing for the days of yesterday, yesteryear recently said that what we need today is more Andy Griffith and less Honey Boo Boo. Now, most of us might agree with that, but the world of Mayberry is not the world we live in today. The world has changed just like it always changes, just like it changed for the followers of Jesus. There they were, basking in the great success of the gospel, but then Jesus was murdered. There they were in the joyful days after the resurrection, but then Jesus went away. What is the world coming to, they must have wondered. Now, one of the reasons I'm a Christian is because this question is not left unanswered by our faith. God knows that people see all the changes going on around us and how we easily become afraid of what will come next. A few weeks ago, I asked a friend who's had a serious health problem how he's doing he said, well, I'm above ground. I'm on the right side of the grass. I said, glad to hear that. He said, yeah, me too beats the alternative. Hmm. The alternative. I'm afraid many of us hold that view that where we are now, as bad as it may be, has, has to be better than where we will be tomorrow, that the, the new world that is coming will be less than the world that we have right now. But our Christian faith says not true. Not true at all. Everything Jesus taught was aimed at creating a future that is bright and beautiful. Even in the days of the most severe persecution of Christians under the Roman government, Christian leaders held up the vision of the better world that is coming. What is the world coming to? Well, listen to what one of them wrote. 
And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with the people, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making everything new. What is the world coming to? That's what the world is coming to, according to our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, if you will, that this new world is not located somewhere up there. There is nothing in the description of this world that sounds like our common descriptions of heaven, people playing harps or bouncing on the clouds or driving on gold-paved streets or not being allowed to drink beer, heaven forbid. The new world that is coming, you see, is this world, transformed into the most wonderful world you can imagine. And I want you to catch that thought today of this world, your world, our world, becoming a beautiful new world through the healing power of God. My good friend and church member, Don Scheel, recently passed along to me a little essay written by his dad. Now, Don's dad is 104 years old. That means Don's going to live to 162 years at least. He lives over at the neighborhood, and Don says his dad knows he's nearing the end of his life, so he's been thinking about heaven, and this is what he wrote about it. I sometimes wonder what heaven must be like. I hope there will be dogs there, like Mopsy, the best family dog ever. But I know some people don't like dogs. I wonder if there will be honeybees in heaven. But it won't be much heaven to some folks who don't like bees or are allergic. I raised honeybees for years, and they paid my way through Michigan State. I look forward to both dogs and honeybees. Could heaven be a place where we are placed on a shelf just to dream of the good times we had on earth? I think not. Could heaven be a place where there is no work? I think not. I like to work and have enjoyed many different jobs. What kind of place must heaven be? No need to work because everything is done for us and no suffering? Why, work and suffering help us to appreciate the good life here on earth. Still, I keep wondering. Streets of gold? I hope not, because I've enjoyed chipping flecks of gold out of rocks found in the mountains. Mansions? I don't need a mansion to be happy. Just a small house would be fine with me. Do we just fly around anywhere we want to go? I think not, because the struggle of going places by walking or in cars or airplanes are wonderful in themselves. Now, this was written before the sequester and the air traffic thing that's going on. Could heaven be a place where everything is given to us? That can't be, because as we go without, we appreciate what we have. I would like to think of heaven as a continuation of life as we know it here on earth, only more wonderful where everybody obeys the Ten Commandments and follows the golden rule. I look forward to new discoveries like a wonderful sunrise, and our past must be like a beautiful sunset. Written by a man 104 years old, Don will read this as a eulogy when his dad passes away. But in the meantime, I think it ought to be our prayer for the world that is coming the world Jesus taught us about. Have you ever noticed that the way Jesus lived, and most especially the way Jesus loved people, 
was sort of an introduction to them of the new world of Revelation 21. It was as if, as people wondered, what is the world coming to, Jesus was replying, welcome to my world. And what a beautiful world it is. Jesus accepted people the world rejected. Jesus forgave sinful people their sin and set them free to start all over again like the prisoner we heard about this morning. Jesus worked hard to make well and heal the brokenness people experience from little things like fevers to things as big as chronic illness and even death. Jesus welcomed strangers and appreciated those no one else appreciated. And Jesus included people everybody else excluded. And Jesus lifted and built up people who life had trampled down Jesus introduced people to a God who is gracious and merciful and always loving, who is with us in every situation and on our side as we face the challenges of life and whose love will never let us go, no matter what. And Jesus paid it all. He gave everything he owned, everything he possessed, everything he valued, including his own blood and his own life, to make it possible for people like you and me to experience this new God-filled world. Welcome to my world, this world, in the process of being transformed into God's new hope-filled world. The other day I was, I was browsing through some pictures I've uploaded to my Facebook page, and there was a picture of an old friend It was a photograph of the old Green Sears water tank. For those of you who don't know the story, the old Green Sears water tank is what provided our camp in New Hampshire with fresh, clean, artesian well water for many years. It it came with the house and served us very, very well for about 25 years, I think, until one day we noticed a leak. There was a hole in the tank. I was all ready to get in the car and drive to Concord, New Hampshire, to buy a new tank when my, when my old friend Bud Shafto showed up. Now, Bud was a guy who could fix anything, and when I told him the old green Sears water tank had a leak and I was going to buy a new one, he started laughing at me. Why don't you just fix it, he asked. I wouldn't even know where to begin, I answered. Got any screws, Bud asked. Of course I have screws. Well, get one. Get one that's bigger than the leak hole and screw it in. So I found a screw bigger than the leak hole, and I screwed it in, and lo and behold, it worked, and the leak was gone. Well, I came home from vacation that summer and told our congregation here about this amazing work of healing that had occurred with the old green Sears water tank. But there were some doubters in the crowd. You know, we have more than just a few engineers (laughs) and chemists, and we've got a lot of people who know everything about everything. And they all said, it's not going to last. You can't screw a steel screw into an aluminum tank. It will cause some corrosive chemical reaction, and you'll just get more leaks. Well, I was devastated, so I called Bud up on the phone. Bud, I said, the geniuses in my church are saying, you can't put steel screws into aluminum tanks. It'll just cause more leaks. Buy more screws, Bud (laughs) said. And that's what we did. I don't know how many screws we ended up putting into the tank, but it was a lot. And it lasted another 10 years or so. And after a long, rich, and productive life, that old green Sears water tank finally succumbed to a burst aneurysm or something and blew a hole in itself far too big for a screw to fix. So we had to lay it to rest, and we celebrate its long, left, its long life. We cherish the memories of all the leaks and all the screws and all the toilet flushes and all the showers and most especially all the precious moments God gave us with our dear friend Bud. 
Bud taught me a lot about hope. If there's a problem, don't give in to it. Work hard to solve it. If there's a mountain you're facing, don't run away. Climb it. If you're carrying a burden, find the strength to bear it. If there is something broken in your life, don't give up. Find a screw bigger than the hole and fix it. Because you see, this is God's world. This is God's world. And in God's world, there are powers of healing and hope and peace to be found and used and brought into our experience right here and now. Welcome to God's world. Jesus taught us how this new world can come to us and how we can bring this new world to others in our lives every day. Just before he was betrayed and killed, he said, a new rule I'm giving to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did Jesus love? I think love is about giving people hope, standing in the middle of the world as it is and pointing to and representing the new world that is already here and that will extend into eternity. Love is helping people find hope. Love is helping people find Jesus Christ. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And when you do, that is a welcome to God's world. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. 
where there is sadness, joy. Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. And now as you go into the world, enjoy it. Where you find it broken, fix it. And most of all, share it with others you encounter. Go in goodness, go in grace, go in peace. Amen.